Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. I want to thank everyone for their kind wishes for my return to health in the comment section of my last video. Fortunately, it was a very quick cold, which I think might become an increasingly common occurrence for me as my son Gabriel is starting daycare now and I am aware that children are essentially pestilence vectors. Last week's cold came from him. All that's to say, I am much better now, so thank you. Before we jump into today's video, I do want to talk about a really fun thing that I got to collaborate on with the wonderful Lauren from Lauren Learns History. And for those of you who follow me on Instagram, and if you aren't already doing so, you should be because it's a good time. In fact, I have now started going live over on Instagram. But if you do follow me, you will have seen pictures of me frolicking about on the deck of the Golden Hind and generally having a lovely time. I am so happy that Lauren invited me to take part. If you're curious to see the finished product, then you're in luck because it went live on Lauren's channel yesterday. So I'll put it in a card and I'll also link it in the description box. Lauren's channel is fabulous, especially if you've got any children around that you are trying to indoctrinate into history geekdom, which I think we should all be aiming to do. I hope you'll check her out and that you'll enjoy her content as much as I do. Also, I want to make a huge shout out to Pete from The Golden Hind for his part in the video and also for taking such good care of us. I'll be leaving a link to The Golden Hind website as well because they've got some really cool information and also some upcoming events that you might like to check out. But now it's time for another look at the macabre side of history as it's still October, thus Halloween month. Today we're looking at a family of hangmen and as family businesses go execution feels like an odd legacy to want to pass along but here we are. Let's take a look. many famous executioners in British history. In fact, I don't think it's stretching it that far to point out that there are probably countless famous or maybe more properly infamous executions that you'd be able to list right now. But the amount of any executioners that you could name is far below that, right? For instance, Anne Boleyn's execution by sword is one of the most famous beheadings in history. But who swung the blade? The swordsman of Calais, said to have connections to Saint-Omer. Fiction has chosen to refer to him as Jean Rombard, but we don't actually know his name. When it comes to Anne's cousin, Catherine Howard, there is even less information about the person who physically ended her life in 1542. However, even if we do know their name, we know almost nothing else about them besides that. Take King Charles II's blundering beheader, Jack Ketch. We are sure of very little about him, apart from his name and the fact that he was famous for doing a terrible job of chopping people's heads off. Fast forward over two centuries and we encounter not just one executioner who we have more details on, but a family of them. The peer points. From the start of the 20th century, first Henry, then his brother Thomas, and eventually Henry's son Albert, would end countless lives of those convicted and sentenced to die. However, they were not the only ones to keep this particular trade in the family. They are, however, certainly the most famous. Perhaps Henry Pierpoint's willingness to make execution into a family business was inspired by the example of the man he assisted when he was first starting out in the trade, James Billington. James had three sons, all of whom would also become executioners, William, John and Thomas Billington. Henry assisted members of this family between 1901 and 1905, from which point Henry Pierpoint was taking the lead in executions for himself. Prior to this, in 1903, 
Henry Pierpoint assisted William Billington at the double hanging of the pair discussed at the end of my video from last week, the Finchley Baby Farmers, Annie Waters and Amelia Sack. Henry would be removed from the official list of qualified executioners by the Home Office in 1910, and at this time the Home Secretary was Winston Churchill. Henry's removal was apparently a result of his seemingly habitual drunkenness. He had reportedly arrived drunk to carry out a hanging at Chelmsford Prison, and then proceeded to fight or assault his assistant John Ellis. It was Ellis that reported Henry to the Home Office. Henry's brother, Thomas, had begun his own hanging career in 1906, having apparently been convinced to take it up and then be trained by his brother. Thomas's career would be far longer than Henry's. He continued on until 1946. And during the span of his career, he is thought to have executed nearly 300 people. The hangman's fee was £10 for each execution, and this rose to £15 in the later 1940s. According to the National Archives currency converter, in 1945, £15 would be the equivalent of approximately £533.27 in 2017, which doesn't sound like very much, but was apparently also sufficient to pay for 10 days labour by a skilled tradesman. It's worth mentioning that the Pierpoint brothers and son did have other sources for income. Equally, by the time the Pierpoints were working, being an executioner was certainly a role that required training and thus skill. Gone were the days of the botched beheadings or of hangings that were simply about taking a condemned person, kicking a stool from underneath them and waiting for them to strangle to death at the end of a rope as would have been the case for any execution you would have witnessed at the famous Tyburn Tree. By the late 19th century, hanging was as much a mathematical problem as anything else. Long drop hangings were now the order of the day, with the desired outcome being that the hanged person's neck would be snapped at the end of a rope. A hanging was considered to have been botched if this was not achieved. To assist a hangman, the Home Office helpfully published an official table of drops to indicate the ideal rope or drop length for the condemned to swing from that was based upon their height and weight. It seems that these ideal lengths were in practice more of a minimum length for those who were actually doing the hangings. A hangman would certainly weigh and measure the condemned but they would then factor in a longer drop than that that was recommended by these tables. On November the 30th, 1905, a new peer point was born in Bradford. Albert was Henry's son and Thomas's nephew. He was 11 years old when he learned the truth about the job that drew his father away from home. And not long after this, Albert would write the following in a school assignment. Quote, when I leave school, I should like to be the official executioner. Perhaps he hoped he would assist his father and be trained by him, as his uncle had been. As it was, his father, who had been removed from the Home Office list for reports of drunkenness and violence while on duty, would die in 1922, when Albert was 17. Uncle Thomas would then step into the role of Albert's mentor. Albert would be trained at Pentonville Prison. In 1932, Albert was 27 years old when he was placed on the Home Office's list of executioners, and as was customary, he began as an assistant. He first acted as Principal Executioner of Record nine years later, on the 31st of October 1941. The condemned was Antonio Mancini, a known gangster who had been convicted in the stabbing death of Harry Distelman, which had occurred in the early hours of the 1st of May 1941. In 1972, Albert's memoir was published. In it, he recounted some of the advice that had been given to him by his uncle. Quote, 
if you can't do it without whiskey, don't do it at all. When his uncle's career came to an end in 1946, Albert became Britain's preeminent executioner. But even before this, he was still lead executioner in a number of high profile cases. During the Second World War, he was tasked with executing enemy spies, in addition to a number of American soldiers who had been sentenced to die by courts martial. After the war, in December 1945, he was sent to Germany to execute 13 convicted war criminals. This number included the Commandant of Bourbon Belsen, Josef Kramer, and one of his camp guards, probably one of the most infamous women from the SS, Irma Grazer. Albert was soon back in Britain, and he found that he had some serial killers to deal with. On the 16th of October 1946, the lady killer, Neville Heath, was hanged by Albert at Pentonville Prison. Nearly three years later, on the 10th of August 1949, he hanged the acid bath murderer, John George Hay, at Wandsworth Prison. Four years after that, on the 15th of July 1953, he hanged John Reginald Halliday Christie. Controversially, three years before Christie's hanging, on the 9th of March 1950, Albert had also hanged Timothy Evans, a developmentally delayed man who had been wrongfully convicted of the murders of his wife and infant daughter. They had, in fact, been killed by their neighbour, John Reginald Halliday Christie. Three years after the Evans hanging, but in the January before Christie's, Albert hanged 19-year-old Derek Bentley, who had been part of a bungled robbery in which his accomplice shot and killed a police officer. The trial, conviction and sentence were controversial in this case too. Bentley claimed that he was encouraging his partner to hand over his weapon when he told him to, quote, let him have it. The prosecution claimed this was actually an instruction to shoot or something that was interpreted as an instruction to shoot by his accomplice. There are suggestions that a childhood head injury, coupled with episodes of seizures, had impacted Bentley's intellectual capacity, making him mentally much younger than his 19 years. Ultimately, in 1998, Bentley's murder conviction, for which he had been hanged, was quashed. Albert Pierpoint is frequently named as the last executioner in Britain, but that title actually belongs to Harry Allen and Robert Leslie Stewart. At 8am on the 13th of August 1964, at Manchester Strangeways Prison and Liverpool's Walton Prison respectively, these hangmen enforce the capital sentence on the two men convicted of killing John Allen West. Harry hanged Gwyn Owen Evans, while Robert hanged his accomplice, Peter Allen. Albert Pierpoint did hang the last woman to be executed in Britain, Ruth Ellis. Her 1955 execution was and is controversial, because it's frequently argued that as she was a victim of domestic violence, of the kind that even resulted in her miscarrying a pregnancy... Ruth's shooting of the man who had victimised her, David Blakely, should perhaps not have resulted in a murder conviction and then the death penalty. In fact, her fate so unsettled and disturbed the British public that it is credited in part for the eventual abolition of the death penalty in this country. Perhaps the significance of Ruth Ellis's execution when coupled with the fact that she was executed alone, rather than the more confusing same-day dual executions across Manchester and Liverpool nine years later, is why Albert Pierpoint is remembered as Britain's last executioner. There is some dispute over the number 
of people executed by Albert over the course of his career. Some sources say it was 435, others say 600, which is an odd thing to lose track of, I'd say. Also disputed is how Albert felt about carrying out the executions. In his memoir, it seems that he's unsure of the value of the death penalty as a form of justice or as a deterrent from crime. More opaque is the fact that he is also quoted as saying, I refuse to speak about it. It is something I think should be secret myself. It is sacred to me, really. He also referred to it as his family's unique tradition of service to the state. Yet, when talking about those he had hanged, he used terms of compulsion or coercion rather than choice, discussing how he had to hang one person or another. But he had volunteered for the role. He'd approached the Home Office to be put on their list. He'd been trained by his uncle and then he had accepted each successive execution as it came up. Like his father and uncle before him, he had other ways to earn money. In fact, Albert's other source of income was running pubs. Whatever his personal private views on execution and the hangings he had taken part in were, we will never know. But I do wonder what he would have thought as he lived through the suspension of the death penalty in 1965 and then when that suspension became permanent in 1969. Albert lived until 1992 and during this period there were still crimes that carried the option of a capital sentence, namely treason and piracy with violence until 1998, so six years after Albert died, at which point capital punishment was also formally abolished for those offences as well. There is now no crime that carries the death penalty in Britain. But what do you think? Were you familiar with the Pierpoints and their macabre family trait? What do you think that Albert thought or felt about being one of Britain's most famous hangmen? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video. Or you can find me on social media. I'll leave links to the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Follow me over on some or all of them so we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, why not share it with your friends? And please also let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel. And if you think you're subscribed, please do have a little check to make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you. While you're there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, why not hit the bell icon beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down menu so that YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.